In this week's video, I am joined by Creepling, and together we will be looking at the attempts of the Interior Ministry to undermine Ashina. In this subject, we will also cover a wide variety of topics, including the attack on Harata Estate, the main players there, and what happens with Owl. There is a story told in the game through various sources of the Interior Ministry's secret attempts to undermine the Ashina clan, to weaken them before the time was right to attack the very walls of Ashina Castle. One of their greatest resources in this regard is an informant, the shinobi known as Owl. The Ministry sees on the information given by Owl to destroy the Harata family and attack Ashina Castle. The great shinobi of course does this for his own motivations, yet the Ministry still benefits from these actions. We know that the Interior Ministry fear the Ashina clan, and the item Ministry Dowsing Powder gives us a really key piece of lore about this. And it reads as follows. The Ministrators fear Ashina, her eyes bloodshot with the waters of rejuvenation. This powder acted as a ward when the time came to turn flame to her walls. The Ministry and the Central Forces would not dare attack Ashina directly until they knew that they were weakened, as they fear the effects of the rejuvenating waters and the fearless and invincible red-eye troops that these spawn. Understanding this fear is essential in understanding the reason behind the Ministry's schemes and underhanded tactics. The conspiracies of the Ministry take many forms, but almost always it involves their agents which I refer to as Shadows, who are basically the basic enemy versions of the Lone Shadows. Indeed, near the time of Ashina's fall, we see the Tengu, or Ishin, desperately attempting to stem the inflow of these Ministry Rats, as he terms them, coming into Ashina. He has caught and killed a number of them at the entrance to Ashina Castle in the Watchtower, and again he has killed one at the back entrance at the Serpent Shrine. These Ministry agents have spread so far and wide that one has even made it to the bottom of the Ashina Depths near Mibu Village, no doubt seeking the source of Ashina's rejuvenating waters, given this is right below Fountainhead Palace. Maybe they are looking for a way to subvert it or claim the power for themselves, at least weaken it before the attack on Ashina. The presence of these agents at various points in the game are key to understand their role that the Ministry plays in various conspiracies against Ashina. These agents are formidable. For example, they can even pose a challenge to Sekiro himself one on one. We will later see that they completely outclass the Ashina Nightjar Ninjas. They are fearsome combatants with lots of skills and a real blend of combat stances, including elements of Senpo. They also use a number of shinobi tools like the shurikens, poison and whistles and we'll see that they have great skills in infiltration and subterfuge. I know it isn't canon, but I let a fight between a Ministry agent and a Tier 1 Ashina general play out, and guess who won? The 8th Prayer Necklace further describes the greatest of these agents, the Lone Shadows, in more detail. Lone Shadows are the Interior Ministry's most trusted agents. Each of Masat Suna's 17 born has a specialty from poison to shinobi hounds. The Lone Shadows are specialists amongst the ninjas of the Interior Ministry, the leaders if you will, and are the named characters that we meet in game as mini bosses. Now, the 17 born line is a bit of awkward English and I think it's a little bit of a localization problem, but what it is trying to say is that these agents are the 17 children of Masatsuna. Whether these are actual blood children, or simply adoptive children who operate under a pseudo-paternal figure, is up to debate. However, it does give these guys a little bit more flavour and personality, and how personally involved this minister is in undermining Ashina. It also gives the impression of a tight bond between the lone shadows, and this explains why the spear bearer fails to dispassionately dismiss the death of one of his siblings and must seek revenge when we meet him in the Serpent Shrine. Ashina prides itself on a strong military 
straightforward warriors and generals who break the posture of their enemies using the Ashina style of fighting. We can learn this from the first prayer necklace about the generals. This is of course the influence of Ishin, who prides himself on the mastery of hand-to-hand, face-to-face, sword-to-sword combat, and he evidently hates underhanded shinobi techniques, calling any type of spy or assassin a rat. However, that being said, Ishin clearly does see the need to have some kind of shinobi, and so he commands the night jars. The night jar monocular tells us that their role is essentially to watch out for any trespassers. So these are less like the interior ministry assassins and saboteurs, and more like a defensive force, a counter to the interior ministry spies. They guard the route towards Ishin's tower, for example, and the rest of the rooftops, and one of them has Genichiro's back during our initial encounter. We will see that the interior ministry completely destroy this facet of Ashina's defence before the main assault arrives. Meanwhile, the interior ministry has clearly attempted to subvert the strengths of the Ashina military by using more underhanded techniques and training a vast army of ninjas and shadows. Now, there are a couple of notable shadows, lone shadows, that we meet in the game, but the most interesting to me from a lore perspective is the interior agent known as the Spear Bearer, because he reveals the notoriety that Sekiro has gained within the interior ministry forces over the past three years since Harata. He refers to us as a demon who cannot die. This master of the blade is also a hound master and sets his dog upon us when we meet him in the Great Serpent Shrine. I speculate that the Spear Bearer ranks highly among the 17 because of two reasons. One, he helped orchestrate the attack on Harata with one of his other siblings. And two, he knows both of the specialist techniques mentioned in the prayer bead's description instead of just one. But I digress. The ministry expected us to die three years before, which is why he refers to us as a demon. Not only that, but the spear bearer himself was one of the agents of the ministry who oversaw the sack and destruction of the Harata estate, and so directly knows what happened there that night, and our fate. He is here to avenge another lone shadow that was killed by Tengu. We can eavesdrop him before the battle. Masanari, I never would have believed a man of your ability could be slain. It appears as though a demon lurks within Ashina. Masanari was actually one of the agents that helped orchestrate the assault on Harata estate, as he cooperated with his sibling, the Spear Bearer, who was also present. For Masanari is the one who converses directly with Juzo the Drunkard. And given the Spear Bearer was also here, we can assume that these siblings worked closely together, and it explains the Spear Bearer's need for revenge. Again, this suggests a strong bond between the 17 born, the 17 children, that he would go out his way to avenge him. The Ministry no doubt sees Sekiro as part of the Ashina clan, given that he was a protector of the Hirata subclan, and thus they need him killed. Not only that, but Sekiro has witnessed what the Interior Ministry has done, and he is a threat to their plans therefore, because they do not want their aggression to yet be revealed. This will not be the last time an agent of the Ministry would make an attempt on Sekiro's life. The Ministry's move to weaken the House of Ashina goes back three years earlier, when they helped precipitate the destruction of the Ashina subclan, the Harata, with the help of their informant, Owl, who was embedded within that family. Owl, in his close contact to the Divine Heir, evidently became covetous of the dragon's blood, given his presence on the battlefield during Ishin's rebellion, his presence at court, and his introducing us to the Harata family. I think it is clear that Owl was a shinobi who was very well embedded within the Ashina. The great shinobi remnant makes it clear that his ambition drives everything. It is for the sake of this ambition that he did everything. The final line is so important of this description. It is literally the cause for every single one of his actions, every plot and betrayal, and is the reason he begins feeding information to the enemies of Ashina. As we relive the memory of the Harata estate attack, 
what we initially see is a simple bandit raid on an estate. Our bandit friend, in the future, a member of the gang, who attacked the estate, tells us of the success and why it was successful. <laughs> so my gang broke into the Hirata estate. Now, as you're aware, the Hirata family is part of the Ashina. Now, normally they mop the floor with petty thieves like us. I mean, no sweat. But it just so happens we broke in during a battle. Yeah. Almost all the young samurai were away from home. And it was a prime opportunity. Then we started a fire and cleaned out the place. Indeed, the timing of this attack is very fortuitous and definitely suggests a more intelligent hand behind the attack than a simple drunkard bandit leader. So the coordinated nature of this attack shows that he has just hired muscle, a cover, for the true masterminds. As we further explore this memory, we can notice a couple of things that suggest that there are other forces at work here. The main one being that high above on a hill, above the burning estate, is an agent of the Ministry as this overseeing the destruction of this Ashina clan. The placement of this seems odd, but later it will reveal the truth. Because when we finally visit Father's version of the event, these agents are everywhere and are very prominent, making it so obvious that the Ministry is behind this attack. As we proceed in the original memory, we witness the death of our father, Owl, who is the one that actually directs us to go where the divine heir is currently hiding. In this hidden shrine that our father directs us to, we meet a rogue agent in this affair, Lady Butterfly. Where does Lady Butterfly fit in all this? If Owl is working with the Ministry, who is Butterfly working for? As battle commence, Sekiro asks a question that the player is probably wondering at this point. Why? Why is she doing this? Why is our former teacher here? What has she got to do with all of this? For that, I'm going to pass you over to Creepling, who recently tackled this subject in his great video about Owl. Over to you, Creepling. Hello guys, Creepling here, a fellow Sekiro lore theorist. I want to tell you a little bit about Lady Butterfly's role in the events at the Hirata estate. She is Wolf's mentor, appointed by Father Owl to train him in shinobi techniques through combat. Those can't be easily learned otherwise. Lady Butterfly's connection to Owl seems to run deep. As a child, she accumulated a lot of experience in illusion techniques in Usui's forest, the same place where, presumably, Owl comes from. Perhaps the two once trained their shinobi skills together, just like Orangutan and Kingfisher once did. But despite this long time connection, the two seem to be at odds with each other. For some reason, Lady Butterfly is locked in the burning temple with Kuro, our divine heir, while Owl is on the outside with the key. While it could have been their elaborate plan to kill Wolf and bury him in the burning estate, I have a theory that there is more to it. Just like Lady Butterfly and Father Owl share their origins, I believe they also share goals. Both of them want immortality for themselves. Owl, knowing that Hirata is low on capable warriors, tipped off the bandits and the interior ministry in order to capture Kuro in the chaos that ensued. That plan almost worked out, except that Lady Butterfly learned about it and was able to get inside Hirata and secure Kuro. Owl decided that dealing with Lady Butterfly and her illusions could be too much, especially if she was able to swear an immortal oath to Kuro. He managed to lock the two of them inside the burning temple and escape. Soon after that, Wolf finds him, only to receive the fatal task to kill Lady Butterfly and return Kuro at any cost just like the Iron Code requires. Lady Butterfly knows why exactly we are there. Notice how she greets us. She doesn't call us Divine Heirs Shinobi or even her student. We are here as the son of Owl, by his request and design. In the end, Wolf succeeds in killing his old teacher, only to be betrayed by his own father. Thanks for that, Creepling. If you haven't seen any of Creepling's videos, and you love Sekiro lore, I highly recommend that you check out his channel, 
as he has sought some great takes on tons of lore in Sekiro. I will link his channel in the description below. I 100% agree with this theory. The only thing that makes sense with her presence here is that she is here to claim the heritage for herself, separate to what's actually going on. As Creepling describes, she will use her illusions to trick Kuro into forming an immortal oath. She is a spanner in Ewell's plan, so we are therefore used by our old father to deal with this interloper, which we successfully do before Ewell shadow rushes us right in the back. Creepling also verbalises what the presence of the Interior Ministry spies actually means. This bandit attack is actually an act of aggression disguised as a simple bandit raid. In the alternate father memory, we can eavesdrop the conversation between the bandit leader, Juzo, and another Interior Ministry agent, which goes as follows. Seemingly easy. Owl's info was right on the money, you know. I don't like him. There's something shifty about him. The smell of a crook. <laughs> ah, he's a villain. A down and out villain, Martinari. Well, he's useful right now, so adore him. This eavesdrops shows us that the Interior Ministry obviously hired Juzo to lead this attack to obscure the fact that the Ministry was behind it. What is also a possibility to me is that Owl will have warned the Ministry about Sekiro as an aspect of the estate's security so that Owl could get him out of the way. He convinced them that his death would be necessary, hence the presence of the Shinobi Hunter among the bandits. For who else other shinobis would actually have been in the estate this night, ourselves and Owl. The Ministry were aware about our presence here, highlighting Owl's need for us to be dead, and it again harkens back to the Spear Bear's dialogue that we examined earlier from the future. This isn't the final attempt on our life Owl and the Ministry have not forgotten about us. In the well where we were once imprisoned, a lone shadow has come for us. We can talk to him from behind before he realises who we are, and he says this. <laughs> he said I'd find a cowardly wolf here. No sign of him though. A broken and incompetent shinobi living in disgrace. I hope to see such a man for myself, but seems I'm out of luck. He has been told by someone, a he, that we are here, weakened from the devastation we witnessed at Harata, both in losing our father and later our lord. This he has directed the shadow here, and once we commence battle, he again professes knowledge about our immortality. This clearly is the information that the Ministry knows, and knows because they were behind the Harata estate attack. The only person that directed the shadow here is Owl, once again supplying information, and it shows his preoccupation and the Ministry's with having us murdered, Given we are a fly in the ointment, we do not die, and this is why we have been called a demon. There's also the fact that I alluded to earlier, that Sekiro is a witness to the Harata estate sack. Remember the Ministry fears Ashina? They are conducting a cold war to weaken them, and before this has been concluded, the Ashina cannot know that direct hostilities have begun. The destruction of the Harata clan was to benefit both Owl and the Ministry. He would give them easy access to destroy one of the Ashina families, weakening the Ashina clan as a whole, whilst he would take advantage of the attack to steal away the child, with us out of the way. As Creepling mentioned, however, this didn't quite work out for Owl. However, the Interior Ministry was extremely successful in weakening their enemies after destroying an entire household, using a proxy so that their hand would not be detected and very little of their own people would actually die in the attack. To the outside world, the Harata clan had been destroyed by Juzo the Drunkard and his gang, when in reality, the Interior Ministry had orchestrated and struck a blow against Ashina without being detected. This would not be the last collaboration between the Owl and the Interior Ministry. To the world and Sekiro, the Owl died bravely at Harata defending his lord. When in reality, he faked his death, was disappointed when he couldn't find Lord Kuro or Sekiro, and then went with the Interior Ministry, pretending he was dead all this time. 
he would next collaborate with the interior ministry when another chance came to attack Ashina and claim Lord Kuro for himself. The ninja of the ministry would infiltrate and attack Ashina Castle, led by Owl himself. Owl has chosen now to reveal himself because he believes Ishin to be near death, weakened. And again, most importantly, Genichiro has been defeated by this point, driven from Ashina Castle. Without the protector in the castle, the Ashina clan are severely weakened, and thus the interior ministry are bold enough to fire a vanguard attack against the castle softening their defences for their main attack, for the main body of the central forces. They clear the rooftops, carving a path to Lord Kuro. This is Owl's aim, but to the Ministry, they benefit greatly. They claim command over the high points of Ashina Castle, killing the Nightjar Ninjas, and being behind the gates. Indeed, we find powerful lone shadows in strategic places within the castle. Vilehan takes the castle dojo right in the heart of the castle, where the spear bearer and his wolves cut off the pass to the sunken valley. Ministry shinobi are in the moat, and we find some actually inside the castle already at this point. In the courtyards below in the castle, soldiers of the Ashina army are being assaulted and ambushed all over. They completely catch the soldiers within the gates off guard. Patrol posts are not turning up where they are meant to be on time. People are running scared. Due to the fact the soldiers probably aren't expecting enemies to pop out from the moat right amongst their walls. The interior ministry shinobi have been even able to smuggle in members of the Red Legion so that they can wreak havoc behind enemy lines. The interior ministry seems to have come from the moat and then used bamboo bridges to climb out and begin their assault. Ingeniously using these easy-to-construct bridges, they manage to climb all the way to the top of Ashina Castle. This again reeks of inside information. It is not hard to imagine that Owl is the one that led them through the moat, being familiar with Ashina Castle and its weaknesses. It is here that we see the Nightjars are completely outclassed. Not only do they fail to prevent the trespass or the breach, but they are also slaughtered giving control of the high places to the better trained Ministry agents. In addition to this attack, the Ministry has made further preparations for the main central forces to attack. The fulminated Mercury item description tells us that in secret they have been developing new forms of gunpowder and it is these mighty weapons that would bring fire to the walls of Ashina in the hands of the Red Legion. Yet Owl has used the Ministry in his mind, to get a path to Kuro. He comes here feigning innocence and concern for the Divine Heir. But Kuro, knowing enough about Owl, having spent enough time with him, suspects something and sees right through him. Yet again he has come with his interior ministry cronies. He needs them to reach the Divine Heir. This symbiotic relationship between the Owl and the ministry is once again thrust into the spotlight. The attack on Harata estate was impeccably timed thanks to Owl's information, and this hit is no different. Like I say, to the outside world, Genichiro has been defeated, and now the interior ministry and the central forces put their plans into motion. Having a vanguard attack the castle is of great benefit when the central forces finally attack not long after. As the game ends, we can see that the central forces attack seems to be a success. This is the result of being undermined and softened up by the interior ministry agents and shadows for years. Without the Harata clan to support them, without the control of the rooftop and the night jar ninjas, and with enemies within their walls when the army attacks, what hope does the mighty Ashina clan have, especially when Genichiro has been driven from the castle and Ishin dies before the battle begins? This subterfuge was born of the ministry's fear of Ashina, Yet ultimately, they played a clever game, not attacking them directly, but undermining them for years and years. So thanks there guys, hope you enjoyed that take on the interior ministry agents, spies and lone shadows. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and a subscribe. Please also check out Creepling channel, I very much appreciate that. And hopefully see you guys next time. Have a nice week.